Welcome back to Most Amazing Top 10. Here are the top 10 evil scientists who performed human experiments. Kicking off the list at number 10, Stubbins Firth. Okay, this is one of the craziest science projects I have ever heard of in my entire life. Ugh, oh, so gross. Stubbins Firth, a researcher from Pennsylvania in the late 1700s. First of all, as you can probably guess, the 1700s, methods back then, they got a little messy from time to time, sure. A lot of firsts in the medical science world back then. Firth was a doctor in training at the time and he decided to prove to the world that yellow fever was not contagious. Yeah, imagine if you had Twitter. Firth would surgically insert vomit from patients with yellow fever into his own body. He would like put it in wounds all over his face, his eyes. He was trying to get it. He was going the extra mile, all in the name of medical research. Thanks, Firth. So gross. Even urine and saliva, anything DNA-wise, anything gross, just pour it in. That's it, all over. Firth, to our surprise, did not get sick. Hmm. Yeah, he was proud of that one too. He told everybody this new revelation. We look back now though, and realized Firth just sampled late stage patients this entire time. So they were further along, much further than the contagious period. Yeah, no one really knew. So basically he volunteered to dump uh, all over his uh. Yeah, history is so gross. Science as well. Gets nasty. Number nine, Robert Liston. In the early 19th century, crowds would gather. They would gather to watch Dr. Robert Liston work. Yeah, he was known as the fastest knife in the West. I know, how many red flags can you find already in this one? A crowd, a fast surgery, what? What's going on? This was a time before anesthesia had been developed, so you wanted things wrapped up quickly, pun intended. He would have you amputated and sutured in three minutes or less. Nice. One in 10 would pass away, but this was a time where those were good odds, until it wasn't. Robert attempted to beat any record previously held that during a surgery he accidentally cut off his assistant's fingers by accident as well as the you know patient's leg but wait it gets worse yeah when he was swinging away he also accidentally hit somebody else watching remember how I said crowds would gather the old surgery crowd yeah this is why you don't stand close it's kind of like crump battles you know you can't get too close disaster is waiting in there you don't get smoked with the timberland I'm glad surgeons are taking their time now I'm also glad no surgeons are trying new experiments at a record time that's also nice too number eight the monster study. Speech pathologists, I have admiration for your profession. You all are amazing. You're literally miracle workers. Back in 1939, speech pathologists at the University of Iowa were determined to crack the secret behind stuttering. Yeah, they believed that it all began with young adults and their fear of public speaking. So these researchers decided to just intimidate people and try and induce stuttering. Like, oh no, don't do, like why? They got patients who were showing signs of stuttering and they verbally attacked them. They kept telling them that they shouldn't speak unless they're sure they can do so properly on the first shot. I'd be like, no, get lost. That's confident, no. The experiment did not induce stuttering, it just induced anxiety and aggression and anger and confusion. Three of these patients later sued Iowa and the university for 925,000. Number seven, Jose Delgado. Okay, we're talking mind control now, so I'll give you a, give you a moment to put on your tinfoil hat. In the early 1900s, Jose Delgado graduated from the University of Madrid. He even lands a professorship at Yale University. Guy's killing it, but his mind was focused focused on others' minds. He was committed to mind control. His go-to method was these implants, like electrode implants with wires. He first used it with primates, as you could have guessed, horrible classic. He would use a remote control to make them do certain moves, even moving on to mind controlling a bull. Yeah, he got in the ring with said mind controlled bull, but then oddly enough, the bull was calm, weird. Almost like there's an implant in his brain and he's confused and doesn't want anything to do with that. Huh, how did he do it? Genius. Reports say that he stopped the bull last second before it charged at him. I say there's a thing in his head and he wasn't sure what was up. That's my vote, poor thing. And then next, as you could have guessed, came the people. 25 people were tested with this mind control device by electronically controlling the brain. He believes armies could be controlled down the road. And until his death in 2011, he was upset. Yeah, he was upset he wasn't cited as often in terms of mind control projects in recent studies. Like, guy who mind control animals in the 1900s. Yeah, we're trying not to do that anymore. Maybe, thanks. Number six, Ilya Ivanov. In the late 1800s, another old weird experiment with animals was underway. Here we go. Soviet biologists, they actually got permission from the country to breed hybrid ape humans. Yep, what did you get up to last summer? Ho oh, ho, let me tell you, my friends. Horrible, who does this? This is crazy, who thinks of this? They grafted an ovary into a chimp and the goal was to fertilize Nora, the chimp, with human DNA, nightmare. So they inseminated a group of chimps, none of them got pregnant, obviously, so instead they tried to flip the project around. This time they had a human inseminated with the DNA of chimps. The volunteer number was obviously low. Luckily, nothing actually happened. This would have been an absolute train wreck. Before the project, went underway, he was sent to Kazakhstan and he thankfully didn't get up to any more science projects at that point. No mixing DNAs, nothing's going around. We're good. We like dodged that bullet, but huh, we got close. Number five, 
William Buckland, late 1700s, contemporary of Charles Darwin himself. Yeah, William Buckland, historically, he made some Jurassic waves. He was the first man to write a description of a fossilized dinosaur. He's into weird stuff, I guess. He's unfortunately also known for weird stuff more than, uh, you know, the dino discovery stuff. William Buckland would eat some strange dishes, all in the name of, you know, science and discovering new things with DNA. They were bored, I guess. He roasted hedgehogs, ostriches, panthers, bats, he ate everything. Like, I get it, it was the late 1700s, but eating these animals as often as he did, plus his brains, now we gotta ask some questions. What's going on? What's the end game here, my guy? One of the most bizarre things that he studied up close and personal was the heart of King Louis XIV. Yeah, the way these scientists would handle tasks like old school testing, not ideal. Actually, quite gross. Number four, Francis Crick. Here we go, before we get really, really dark here with the science and health studies and stuff, we need to mention aliens. You heard me, tinfoil's on already, we're good. In the early 1900s, Francis Crick, the guy who discovered DNA alongside James Watson, two brilliant minds, dare I say life-changing discoveries, they also believed in directed transpermia, meaning that humans were put on this planet by aliens. Yeah, like extraterrestrials, like actual like aliens, like another species planted us here on purpose, like a science project. Yeah, scientists believe that they are a science project. Some of his methods, conversations to patients were obviously quite sketchy with these beliefs in order. Hey, let's talk about DNA. I'm brilliant. Also, did you know aliens left you here? Great, have a great day. Here's your bill. It's a lot of money. It's really old. Number three, John Bodkin Adams. He was once a general practitioner in the British community in Essex, and most of his patients were unfortunately elderly. And he treated said elderly patients with care. Now, there's obviously more. It gets dark. From 1946 to 1956, John had around 160 patients that all suspiciously died. And out of those 160, 132 of them just happened to leave valuables over for him. Yeah, he ended up dying a very rich man. What are the odds? Must have been some great care he was providing, eh? Not fishy at all. Of course, the wills were later found out to be fraudulent because, well, as for this list, it was the worst of the worst. And the worst part of all this? John was acquitted after everything. Yeah, his trial established that the doctrine of double effect, which is where a doctor giving treatment with the aim of relieving pain, may lawfully, as an unintentional result, shorten their life. So they're like, oh, it sometimes happens, so we can't punish him. Yeah, no. Look at the numbers here. So out of the dozens of cases that ended horribly, Adams was only charged for two. And he wasn't even convicted of their deaths even. He was just guilty of forging prescriptions and falsifying medical forms. He even reopened his practice. Yeah, although he was fined. He was fined only 2,000 pounds. The general public knew he had taken the lives of at least eight people, so he didn't do much after that. But like I said, he ended up passing away rich at the age of 84. Number two, Morris Bulber. He was once part of the Philadelphia Poison Ring, which, yep, already you're like, oh, number two, we're already here. Here we go. Yeah, that was a real thing. How horrible does that sound? The Philadelphia Poison Ring. Okay, it was led by these two Italian cousins. It was led by Paul and Herman Petrillo. This was back in the 1930s. And these two brothers, these two bros, they were perfect for each other in a horrible, dark, disgusting way. Harold was the arson who knew how to make counterfeit money, and Paul ran an insurance scam out of the back of his tailor business. So already this awful duo exists, and then in comes Morris Bulber, this Jewish-Russian immigrant who believed in something called La Fatura, this magical practice that Italians from South Philadelphia believed in at the time. So bad, and then in comes crazy science, medical magic, just to make it better. Yeah, just add some spirit fingers into this horribleness. So Dr. Bulber would come in and give potions to patients, specifically patients from these cousins that they issued insurance policies from without medical exams. So they got this Dr. Bulber to then poison them with arsenic. The reason they had this scheme was because their insurance policies paid out the gang rather than the now widowed wives. How sad is that? This kicked off around 1931 and roughly 50 people bit the bullet before he was thankfully arrested in 1939. And yes, he turned the evidence over so those two cousins were also equally found guilty. Yeah, everyone's sentenced to death here. And finally, number one, Dr. Satan. There's a fun little nickname, Dr. Satan. Yeah, let's talk about this guy. Marcel Petio. It all started when he was young, as most of these do. He would get expelled from school, he had trouble with other students, and his first crime, his first adult crime, was mail fraud. Reminder, this was the early 1900s. Marcel was actually found to be mentally unfit to stand on trial after he was arrested, so later he joined the army. Yeah, that's the real sentence. That's the order that things happen in. The army later discharged him after he was caught stealing blankets. And come 1921, he decided to get a degree. Yeah, he began practicing in France, and at the same time in 1926, he became the mayor. Yeah, we have a medical doctor and mayor all at the same time in the early 1900s. This sounds like a Tim Burton movie already. I'm already nervous. The guy loses his spot as a mayor because he stole power from the city. Yeah, he stole power from the city, like a real villain, right? And in 1933, his crimes became historically horrible. YouTube doesn't like us talking about Hitler and the Yahtzees, but we'll rhyme them, you know, we'll outrhyme the algorithm. This is history, we gotta talk about it. Marcel would talk to Jewish residents while World War II was on 
unfolding and he would lie. He would say that he's gonna assist them by injecting them with what he said was medicine. But after they'd passed away, he would steal all their belongings and dispose of their bodies in the basement. It's horrible. It's perhaps one of the worst things I've ever heard of. Come 1943, he was thankfully arrested. And after the liberation of Paris, he was found guilty for killing over 60 people. And in 1946, he finally met his fate via the guillotine. Those are the top 10 evil scientists who performed human experiments. If you want a part two, believe it or not, we can find 10 more. Humans suck. You don't. Thanks for watching. I'm Taylor McWaters. See you next time. Thank you.